by the way, just before we launch into the message, how many really enjoyed the message that Sarah brought last Sunday? <laughs> yeah. She does such a phenomenal job. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, we're in a series on the Holy Spirit, and uh, why would we want to focus on that? And the answer is because the Holy Spirit is the way that God is with us today. Like if you lived a couple thousand years ago in Jerusalem, you might have been able to walk a dusty road with Jesus in, in, in his physical body. And that's how you could be with God then. But how can you be with God now? And the answer is through the Holy Spirit. The challenge is, is that some people feel like their experience of God is, is lacking in some way. And then they wonder if the problem is actually them. The truth is, is that the depth of our faith is often determined by the thoughts that we think. And if we have misconceptions or misunderstandings, it can limit our capacity to experience God in a much deeper way. There's a verse I want you to look at, and it looks like a throwaway verse in the Bible. It looks like something that Paul just puts in either to take up space or just to be polite. And it's really easy to miss the value of a verse like this. But in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, it says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and it doesn't sound like much. You say, well, okay, he's being polite. There's something very rich in there. What is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? And then in... Uh, the gospel or, or the epistle of 1 John, the first chapter, beginning in the third verse, John writes that we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you might have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. We, we start this very early in life. When we want to punish someone, we isolate them. We start this with children. It's called time out. It's not time out, it's time alone. <laughs> and as it turns out, we don't like being alone. And we carry this on in life. We can get shunned by friends and isolated, even in prison, which is a place where they've kind of timed you out from society. Even there, sometimes you can wind up in, in solitary confinement. And here's the thing about isolation is it's very painful. And I didn't just tell you something you didn't already know. When we feel like we belong, we tend to make healthier choices and we tend to feel happier. And when we feel like we don't belong, we tend to make unhealthy choices. And this is really interesting. We'll try to do things that we assume will make us happier, but in fact, it just is an effort to numb the pain that we're experiencing. Uh, we read from John's epistle, and John was one of the followers of Jesus when Jesus was on earth in the flesh, and he became a leader in the early church. And he makes just a statement that's a little bit disorienting and might be confusing, maybe even uncomfortable. He says, the reason we proclaim the life, the teachings, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus is so that we may have fellowship. Really? Jesus came to our world, taught, did miracles, died a horrible death, and raised from the dead so that we could have fellowship. That's it. And the reason we think like that is because we've defined fellowship as the coffee we drink and the donut we eat before or after church. So really, Jesus came so that I could have a donut. Well, that's included, but that's not all the reason. So what's going on? 
we have to understand how scripture and how the early church thought about fellowship. And fellowship is intimate connection and generous sharing with others. It's an intimate connection and generous sharing with others. I would think that after two years of some distance that we've had to experience because of a virus, we would have even a better appreciation for what it is to be together. The early church highly valued fellowship, and it's not because they were told they should. It's just that when you're part of a community that's life-giving, it actually is life-giving. And they thoroughly enjoyed it. If we're going to follow God out of the shallows of our faith into a deeper relationship, the truth is, is that we cannot travel alone. We cannot claim that we are following God and then try our best to avoid the people who are also following God. In fact, for those of you who are watching online, I want to say welcome and I'm glad you're watching. And this is what I would say. I would say that if you are online because you couldn't be here today physically, or if you are online because you have health concerns, I'm glad. If you are online to avoid people, you are limiting your faith. You are guaranteeing a shallow experience. Fellowship is a very real and powerful thing. So, the more you discern the promptings of the Holy Spirit in your life, the more connected you will be with others. Let me say that again. The more discerning you are of the promptings of the Holy Spirit in your life, the more connected you will be with others. We should be highly suspicious of promptings that isolate us from other believers. Spiritual living is not a nocturnal exercise. We're called to live in the light. Um, uh, two weeks ago, we discovered God is love. And in this week, we're discovering God is light. And light actually helps us to see things clearly. And the challenge about that is there are some things that, that we don't want to see quite as clearly. We prefer the light. We, we like dimmer switches sometimes, don't we? Has anybody been on a Zoom call in the last two years? That's, that's most of you. That, that's, most, that's the biggest response I've ever had to a question I've asked. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's a feature on Zoom. It's a, it, you can go into the settings and you can say, touch up my appearance. Did you know that? I look better on Zoom than I look in real life. I max that little puppy right out. <laughs> it's as high as it can go. I look like a 30-year-old in-shape male. <laughs> and that's not even close to true. See, we often prefer to step into the shadows because there are things we don't want to see and we don't want to be seen. But shadow living is always shallow living. We have to think this through. Say, well, uh, I'm a loving person. Good. Uh, let's put that to the test. Let's put you with a lot of people and turn the lights on <laughs> and see how loving you really are. Oh, I'm a generous person. Great. Let's put you with a lot of people and see how. I'm a healthy person. Great. Let's put you with a lot of people. When we're with people, this is what's important. That's when the lights come on. It is easy to stay in the shadows when we are alone. But when you're around people, they see stuff. They notice. And being around people makes it harder to pretend. Pretending actually separates us from other people. And this is the weirdest thing about it. The reason we pretend is so we'll be included. But something internal happens when we're pretending. And what happens is we know what we are presenting is not the real us. And then we fear that if anybody finds out the real us, they will reject us. 
So our tendency is to put a little distance between us and others, and that always leads us into darkness. Listen, none of us are perfect. If we were perfect, we wouldn't need grace. If we were self-sufficient, we wouldn't need God's power in our life. We need to be with each other because we are a needy people. That's what it means to walk in the light. Now, some of us really don't have a lot of confidence that the Holy Spirit will do much in our lives or in our worlds. And I actually think that the root of that is because we haven't let him do much in our heart. If your heart hasn't changed that much, you're probably not likely to have a lot of confidence that the Holy Spirit will do much else. So one of the early things that the Holy Spirit starts helping us with is to be honest. Because honesty is a form of humility. It's real, it's hard not to pretend that we know more than we do. It's hard not to pretend, period. And that honesty is humbling. But humility is what opens every door in God's kingdom and a lot of doors in our world. In fact, in our world, there's something called recovery programs, and they're designed to help people deal with compulsive behaviors and addictions in their lives. And one of the things that you find out is when those people get together, they are honest. What helps them is not that it's a powerful presentation or a new idea. What actually helps them get better is that they're honest about what they're struggling with. They admit their failures. They acknowledge that they feel powerless. And what happens is, is in that, what, the, what are they doing? They're bringing light into the real life that they are living, and that's how they find grace, and that's how they find strength, and that's how they find support from others. And it's how they find freedom. They, the more alone we are, the more likely we are to be to engage in self-deception. And our capacity for self-deception is hard to, to measure. It's a big number. So uh, I think we want the Holy Spirit to do things like heal a person <clears throat> that we know that, that we like and, and they're going through a physical challenge. But the Holy Spirit also comes to not just heal physical things, but to shine light on spiritual and emotional things in our lives. And uh, this is a misconception, so I'm just gonna say something, you probably won't like it, uh, but it's true. A lot of us pursue the Holy Spirit to get a good feeling. And one of the works of the Holy Spirit is to make you dissatisfied with the way things are. If all you do is feel happy all the time, you might never take a step towards health. And so the Holy Spirit can actually make us a little more dissatisfied with something. So the challenge is, is that we crave that kind of community, but we're also afraid of being a part of it. We want to be open and honest, but we actually fear that we're going to be disapproved of or we're going to disappoint someone. We want to share our struggles, but at the same time, we don't want to be rejected or judged. And these fears, fear is what drives us into the shadows and into the shallows. And our tendency then is to try to protect our heart in some way. And every wall we build to protect our heart just separates us from others. We can't experience freedom that way. So fear kind of drives us into the shallows. I would like to just address real quickly three fears that I think people have about going deeper in God's spirit. And the first fear is this, the fear that we'll become weird. If you start going deep in God, you're just going to become a weird person. Maybe you saw a weird person and they blamed God for it. And, and you just go, well, okay, I don't want to become like that. Uh, maybe we assume if we start going deeper in God, we'll start acting like some preacher on TV or some person you saw in an online video. Let me show you what the Apostle Paul said happens to people who go deeper in the things of the Spirit. And I'm actually using the message translation for this because the verse is so familiar, I wanted you to hear it with different words. It's in Galatians, the fifth chapter. It says, what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity, 
We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life. <laughs> Do you hear that? The deeper you go in spirit, you're less likely to try to force your way in life, able to marshal and direct your energies wisely. A deeper life in God actually makes us more loving, more confident, more compassionate. And none of that is weird. I'm not saying it's common. Nobody thinks that's weird. I think we are also, uh, we fear that we'll be forced to think and live a certain way. Uh, if you have uh, been raised in kind of a religious environment that was dogmatic on certain uh, biblical concepts or, or maybe even they, they leaned towards legalism, that if you didn't measure up in all of these areas that you are, are uh, cast out of God's family and, and you're lost forever. And so some people use a legalistic approach to life because they think it's going to call people up. And what I can tell you is putting people down never calls them up. And, so, and by the way, legalistic environments use a lot of peer pressure. And uh, we get frustrated when our kids surrender to peer pressure, but a lot of times we do the very same thing. In fact, sometimes they learn that from us. Uh, that life in the spirit thing that Paul was just talking about, this is what he goes on to say in Galatians 5. Legalism is helpless in bringing this kind of life about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good crucified. In legalistic environments, people tend to hide their faults. That's going back into the shadows and into the shallows. In legalistic environments, we feel judged by God and others. Hidden sin destroys us. Confessed sin heals our soul. This is what it says in James 5. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be, what's the word? Healed, yes. So the Holy Spirit helps us talk about the areas we struggle with. And the purpose, this is really important, especially in our culture today. The purpose of disclosing our sins is not to have our sins affirmed. It's to have our souls healed. So the Holy Spirit calls us to this. The third thing that I think people are afraid of in a deeper life in the Spirit is they're afraid that they will be asked to share. Don't you just want that to happen? I mean, what, how would you feel if I just left the stage this morning with my mic and said, I'm just going to call on some people to share this morning? Instantly, even less people would be making eye contact with me than right now. <laughs> oh, I think I'm getting a call. Oh, I hear my baby crying. I just, um, we're afraid. We don't like to share because we're afraid we'll say the wrong things or we'll sound like we're uninformed about something, we're unknowledgeable. And here's something I want you to think about. I don't think, so let me put it this way. A lot of us want the Holy Spirit to make us confident to share. Actually, the Holy Spirit wants to make us brave and they are not the same thing. With confidence, you don't feel awkward. But if you're being brave, I guarantee you're feeling a bunch of things that aren't necessarily great, but you're committed to taking a step anyway. The Holy Spirit will make you brave. That doesn't mean every conversation will feel comfortable. The Holy Spirit has come to make us brave, which means we face the uncomfortable things. Now, here's a really interesting concept. If we start facing these fears and go deeper in the spirit, this is what's true. Going deeper also requires going wider. 
It's not a choice. You can't do one without the other. We tend to gravitate or hang around people that are a lot like us, similar in age, similar in education, similar in income, similar in relational status, similar in all kinds of things. And social media has only compounded this. Like It's easier to find people just like us. But here's what I want you to know. It's very difficult to learn anything new when you're around people who are just like you. You all already know what you know. How are you going to learn something new? The Holy Spirit can expand your circle to include people who are not like you. If, if we spend time who think like we think and vote like we vote and have the same uh, uh, color skin that we do, then we're likely to remain in the shallows. Christianity actually spread far beyond its original sectarian beginning and its geographical beginning and it spread all over the world. There were groups that were included. Every group that was not Jewish was considered Gentiles. It just basically means not Jewish. And non-Jewish people were welcomed into the church. And what they had in common was not the food that they liked or the language that they spoke or the way that they thought about political realities or any of those things. What they had in common was a love for Jesus, which was more important than all those other things. They would rather eat a meal that wasn't their favorite with someone who loved Jesus than they would to eat the meal that they preferred with someone who wasn't at all interested in Jesus. So the Holy Spirit comes in and he starts to dissolve our insecurity. The early church was known for hospitality, humility, and miracles. God so loved the world, the whole world, that he gave his one and only son. Peter, the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem, he, he was challenged by the Holy Spirit to expand his circle. And he wasn't happy about it and he wasn't good at it, but he was willing to try and the result is he winds up in the home of someone that he never would have spent any time with before that. And their entire family comes to know Jesus. His willingness to try was greatly used by God. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. Following Jesus will widen your circle rather than narrow it. If your circle is getting narrower, you should ask yourself who you're following. Seriously. To expand your circle, start taking an interest in others. I mean, we kind of like it when someone takes an interest in us, right? We can do that for others. And this doesn't require that you think less of yourself. It might require that you think of yourself less. When we walk into a room like this, it's easy to scan quickly to see who's like us, who we already know, who we already have a connection with. But in a room like this, there's someone who's quite different than you. And they could be one conversation away from an introduction to grace. And the Holy Spirit might actually be encouraging you to expand your circle. Well, Pastor, I don't know what to say. Um, I know. I don't either. I have a couple fallback things. Oh, the weather. <laughs> At least it's not snowing today. <laughs> yeah. You can introduce yourself. You can say hi. Questions are better than statements. It doesn't have to go a long time. But that simple action can expand your circle. And in doing so, we're stepping not into something that's shallow, but a little bit deeper, a little bit richer, a little bit fuller, something that we need even more dependency on the Holy Spirit on. And as it turns out, that's a really good thing. Would you bow your heads this morning? Uh, Father, help us to step into the light and away from the shadows. 
Help us learn to be honest and vulnerable. And help us to identify the fear that keeps us from being more open with others. Because you have come to set us free from that fear. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.